Hello, Rim of the Most High God, and welcome to this month's edition of the Kingdom War Room. Each month we will conduct a Kingdom War Room where we will discuss with key leaders in the body of Christ topics that are strategic, that deal with end-time prophecy, or deal with new things that God is revealing that are pertinent to our development in the kingdom of God. This month, uh, in this discussion, we have myself representing Kingdom Intelligence Briefing and Biblical Life TV. My website is www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. And my co-host, and uh, Dr. Michael Spaulding, who is uh, the teaching pastor of Calvary Chapel of Lima, Ohio, the author of Make the Preaching Great Again, and the host of Soaring Eagle Radio and Dr. Mike Life. Doc, Mike's website is www.drmikespaulding.com. And we're honored tonight to have Douglas Woodward, a good friend of mine, who is also the best-selling author of 12 books to include The Power Quest 1 and 2. And I, I need to stop there, Doug, and, and just in your introduction. Anybody that wants to understand the uh, how much the, 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 those in power in America want to dive into the occult and utilize that power, they need to get Power Quest 1 and 2. And that, that should be in everyone's library. So, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, write Power Quest, Doug Woodward down, jump on, on Amazon and uh, order both of those. Uh, he's also wrote Decoding Doomsday, The Final Babylon. His new book is titled Rebooting the Bible, Part 1, Rediscovering the Ancient Bible of the Early Church. Doug's website is www.faith-happens.com. Now, what we're going to be talking about tonight, you know, historically, the Jewish people have been known for their diligent work in maintaining the text of the Old Testament, or at least that's what we've been taught. However, we need to ask the question, is there evidence of altering the text of the Old Testament after the rejection of Jesus as Messiah, and can those alterations be found in the Masoretic text that is being used today? And that's where we bring in Doug and we let him loose because he has done some very intriguing <laughs> research, haven't you, brother? Well, I have. I, I have to admit that up until about a year and a half ago, um, I didn't know any of this stuff. I really didn't. I mean, I had heard a few rumors about uh, a little dialogue that Justin Martyr had with a guy named Trifo. But uh, other than that, it, it was like, wow. And then I stumbled across uh, a fellow named Barry Setterfield, who uh, happens to be a young earth creationist, which I'm, which I'm not. But, but, uh, but he had done some excellent work on the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Bible that was written in, uh, well, not written, translated. Portions, the Pentateuch was translated around 285 B.C. And, uh, but I had I, I was intrigued by that, and uh, and it launched me into research, and I ultimately decided, wow, this is something that that the, the church, kind of the community, that those of us are into Bible prophecy, um, and some of what you know might be called the fringe, um, that, that we really don't know much about. That that in fact the early church was using a for all intents and purposes, a different Bible. It was the, the Old Testament that was the Greek Old Testament, and it was what was quoted uh, about 90% of the time in the New Testament when uh, the New Testament writers were, in fact, uh, in fact, quoting it. You know, I've noticed when I was studying the Word of God, there's, there's a variation uh, looking at the Hebrew text and what we see in the New Testament whenever they quote the Bible. Uh, the Old Testament, especially in uh, the book of Hebrews, really kind of uh, caught my eye, but I, I, you know, I basically said, okay, this was maybe just a variant in, in translation. Uh, but you're saying there's actually something more to that than just uh, than just a variant that they were using the Septuagint almost exclusively uh, within the New Testament church. That's correct. In fact, the the uh, it's clear eighty percent of the time scholars say eighty percent of the time that the quotations are directly from the Septuagint because um, the Septuagint was Greek and obviously the the, he, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, same type of Greek, and uh, and then about ten percent of the time uh, the verses of the are the same. Uh, you know, so there's no difference between what became the Masoretic text, which we can call probably today let's call it the Proto Masoretic text or Proto NT. And the other 10% of the time, it's very likely that uh, Paul or others were either paraphrasing or they were using a different Hebrew text that was not the Hebrew text that was, uh, in fact, uh, utilized and became the proto-Masoretic text. So the Masoretic text was really not uh, – that we know today, it, it actually didn't even exist as it was, I'm going to say, rewritten. Um, around 100 
uh, AD in that time frame, about uh, three decades to four decades after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Brother Mike, you have anything you want to jump in and share here? Well, uh, yeah. So <laughs> just as soon as you say that, Doug, I, I'm just imagining uh, all kinds of feedback and comments. Um, you know, I follow you on your social platforms, and so I, I – <laughs> see and read all of the comments and and uh, I, I, I don't jump in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's pretty clear what it is you're saying. and mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was I was looking today um, on on one of your posts and, right. and I, th I think it was on Facebook. Yes. Um, so so why is it? Here's my question. Why is it that there is is so much emotion uh, tied to this idea that perhaps the Masoretic text is not what people think that it is? Mm -hmm. Why why the such the the heightened emotional response in your opinion? Yeah, why is it that people are saying that Satan has control of my mind <laughs> and I'm and I'm going to hell? I was trying not to say that, Doug. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there a lot of people are saying that right now. I have a few defenders out there, but more people are saying that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it it really boils down to a psychological issue. It's known as cognitive dissonance, and what that means is that if you're challenging a challenging a tightly held belief upon which a person really bases sort of their all of their thinking. They base their life around it. Uh, if you're challenging that, then you're going to get incredible pushback. And the the issue boils down to, I think this, if I can articulate it clearly, um, is that if we say that the King James Version, upon which the Masoretic text, really the Masoretic text was the, was the primary text for the Old Testament, and then what's called the Received Text, Textus Receptus, was the text for the New Testament. If we if we base our beliefs on that, and then and we and we argue that it has to be perfect because. That's what God is. God is perfect, and God has preserved his word. And, you know, God must preserve his word. He promises to preserve his word. And so what that means to those folks that are in this community, and there's a pretty good percentage of us evangelicals that are in this community. I think it's less than 10 percent, but it's it's not 1 percent. It's, it's, you know, it's a pretty big number. But I think what it is is that they want the surety, the certainty of saying we can trust, we can just – throw ourselves entirely upon the King James Bible. Every word is accurate. Every word is true. In fact, it's so true that the 47 scholars that were involved and under the auspices of King James to write the King or to translate the King James Bible, you know, it, it's it's not just that they translated it correctly. In fact, they had new revelation. So as they were writing things in English, they were actually improving upon what was written originally in Hebrew and Greek. And uh, and there are several proponents of this view, but they do kind of blend over into some of the community um, that that you know we uh, work with and we are you know with in our conferences and things like that. And so that's why I'm catching flack from certain unnamed parties. But um, nevertheless, it's because they want that clarity, that assurity, that that's the way God has preserved His Word. They do not want to hear the phrase textual criticism. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's problematic in itself. The, uh, the King James has been, has been corrected and updated hundreds of times. In fact, one of my good friends, Dr. Carl Koch, his professor of Greek, Hebrew, or language professor uh, out at Fuller Theological Seminary when he went through, uh, he, was, uh, he, was, you know, he was a, uh, a Coptic Christian, so he, and he literally <laughs> learned uh, how to speak Hebrew from the Hebrew Bible. And he, mm. he, th this guy was so good that if there was ever a uh, a treaty for the United States that they needed to translate from whether it was Hebrew, Aramaic, or whatever Middle Eastern lang uh, language, uh, this guy is the guy the U.S. government would go to. And, wow. And he found over 40 mistakes in the King James Bible that was corrected back in the 1950s. One of them literally said that Jesus was a created being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And, yeah. and so, so uh, the, the inspiration is, is in the original text. And I, I think one of the things that we're seeing come, come up with this, because uh, one of the things I, I've, been, I've been teaching people to pray, I guess, now for the last 10 years is, is Lord, let everything hidden be revealed. And that's, <laughs> that's not only going into Washington, D.C. Uh, I think God is revealing a lot of things because he is calling the Jewish people back into the kingdom and had to do that, these discrepancies have to be brought to light. Well, I, I think so. And that's one of the things that is beginning to happen is that we're beginning to see uh, some Jewish people rediscover the Septuagint and rediscover that what the Septuagint was based on was as close to the original autographs as we're going to get. In fact, it, in, the, in, in the instance of Nehemiah and Ezra, you may be looking at in the Septuagint because this was only uh, its translation was really within less than maybe 150 years. The uh, the scrolls, you know, that were brought down from Jerusalem to Alexandria. Um, and, and this may have happened over more than one occasion, but anyway, uh, we don't have to get into the so-called uh, legend of the letter of Aristeas, but it's, you know, it's part of the story. But nevertheless, Ezra and Nehemiah uh, were instrumental, of course, in rebuilding the walls and leading the remnant that came back from Babylon. And they, uh, yeah, obviously, they were involved in writing the books called Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, at least I believe that they were. I think even liberal scholars believe that because it's close enough to modern times that they uh, that they find find that to be true. But essentially, you may be looking at a, you know a first generation copy of what they wrote that is in the Septuagint. So uh, it's it's likely to be extremely close, if not almost identical, word for word, with what was originally written by Ezra and Nehemiah. But you have about 400 years from the time that the Septuagint was first written, the Pentateuch, until the Proto-Masoretic text was rewritten around 100 AD. And so you have this vast period of time, let alone things that we may get into, the codices and so forth. We can talk a bit about Textus Receptus, although that's New Testament. My focus is Old Testament, clearly, as Mike uh, Spalding has seen. Uh, I have to be ready to defend the whole enchilada, including the New Testament, uh, <laughs> as it comes to the uh, the issue of the King James. So, uh, so nevertheless, uh, yeah. and, and of course, the real, the real overarching point, there's a couple. One is that the Septuagint was the Bible of the early church. It was the Bible of the early church, really, and, and still is today and has never lost the continuity with the Orthodox Church in the East. But uh, it, the Vulgate, while it was written in 400 AD uh, by Jerome, it was, it was hundreds of years before it sort of got you know, became viral, if you will, and uh, became the Bible of the Latin church. So the Septuagint, as it was copied into, um, you know, Syriac, the Peshitta, um, the Coptic, and so forth, these these uh, scriptures really came from the uh, either the, the Greek Septuagint or what is now known the, in terms of what's the the Vorlog, the original Hebrew is also known as H70. And this, um, in fact, is the it is the Vorlag, V O R L A G E of the Hebrew, um, uh, you know, or of the Septuagint. It's the Vorlag, really, of the of the Hebrew. Uh, what was we believe compiled by Ezra uh, in the uh, fourth century B.C. And so that's really what we're dealing with. We're we're dealing with these ancient texts and the early church, um, and I think this was providential. Uh, clearly is providential for Alexander the Great to conquer the world and to force people to speak Greek. Um, and uh, that created a, a Greek Bible that literally by 100 AD had become known by the rabbis, which were formerly Pharisees, by the way. It became known as the Christian Bible. And that's why they began, that's why they decided they needed to rewrite the Hebrew Bible and fix a bunch of the verses that spoke about how the Gentiles would come through the Messiah into the people of God, that uh, spoke about the nature of the deity of the Messiah, that he's from eternity and so forth. These are things that the, that the rabbis cum Pharisees decided that they needed to change. And uh, that's why there are so many, there's, you know, dozens of major differences and uh, and so anyway so that's really at the heart of the of this story you know when you look at it there's there there's a conspiracy afoot 
And, Indeed. And that was a real hatred toward Messiah. Uh, and even, <laughs> even though, like within Torah and different sections of, of the Tanakh, there are warnings to never alter any text whatsoever. That's correct. But, you know, Rabbi Akiba, and, and you have studied him quite a bit, so Dr. Mike, uh, I have to say Dr. Lake since I got two Dr. Mikes in the line. Um, you may want to comment here, but but Akiba uh, and what was going on in this, this uh, known as the academies or the schools in uh, a little village outside of today's Tel Aviv, Javnia, um, uh, Javnia uh, that, that in this academy they were, in effect, building the the basis for the oral law. Now, the oral law was already in play even by the time that, of Jesus, because we know Jesus remarked and, uh, and scolded the Pharisees for taking the words of men and turning them into the words of God and denying the words of God. And that was, that was kind of the oral law in its early beginnings. But the oral law became the basis for the authority of the rabbis. And with the temple destroyed, essentially the, the Pharisees, who took on this new name called the rabbis, they had overwhelmed and defeated the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, all the scribes, because they were associated with the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, the you know it basically destroyed the infrastructure of Judaism, and so the Pharisees really were the winners of that contest, and uh, the Pharisees decided that to substantiate their authority, they needed to create and effect the oral law, and to codify the oral law, um, which uh, was you know kind of a two-step process: the Mishnah and then ultimately the Talmud. And, uh, and of course, by really by the time we get to, let's say, the end of the second century A.D., you have really a, you know, I would call it, a, call it a chasm between Judaism, the new Judaism, and Christianity. Uh, the new Judaism goes off to Babylon and uh, literally goes off to Babylon, and for the next 300 years, the Talmud is written. And then after that, the Masoretes, the namesake of the Masoretic texts, come into play, and they start, in effect, doing this, this meticulous counting of all of the letters to ensure that the, that the Hebrew text has not been tampered with. And so they do that for several hundred years. Uh, and by uh, about a thousand, about a, uh, it's the ninth century AD, you sort of have the, the Masoretic text that's been put together. But the problem is that although some Christians wax lyrical about the meticulous nature of the uh, assuring that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures were correct, the problem is that they didn't realize that the scriptures had been corrupted hundreds of years before at the end of the first century. Now, not totally corrupted. It really focuses on the Messianic prophecies and the chronologies of Genesis 5 and 11, because those were instrumental in trying to identify the timing of when Messiah would come. You know, when you look at the, uh, uh, the Mishnah and the, the Talmud both, and I've, I've got them both in English, and, and years ago I, I went through them because I was really trying to, to rediscover the Hebraic heritage, and I wanted to know what they had wrote. And mm-hmm. uh, you, you can see this, this flavor of really a hatred for Jesus, and, a, and as well as them, there are certain scriptures that even in the Masoretic text, whether you're dealing with trying to calculate uh, the timing that Daniel saw or really mm-hmm. looking at Isaiah 53, uh, they literally put curses on anyone that would try to figure and calculate these things out. Oh, yeah. And, and anything, I, it's amazing, and, isn't it? And yeah. Anything that they need to do. Now, when we take this back to Akiba, I, I think, you know, I think you're right on. Akiba is ground zero in starting this. But it wasn't just in the altering of the Hebrew text. There are several things that he did. Uh, mm-hmm. One of them I've been able to trace back the origin of Kabbalah to Akiba. And, uh, you know, what? You know, I've talked with uh, friends of mine, colleagues that are experts in this area, because I, I had a theory. You had a guy that hated Messiah. You had a church moving in authority that they didn't have, as well as spiritual power they didn't have. And so I think they drew from the mystic arts that they had learned in Babylon to create a pseudo-Holy Spirit, if you will, uh, mm. in, in the magical working of, of Kabbalah. And as the story goes, I believe, and you may need to correct me because it's been a long time since I've read this, that I believe it was either six or seven uh, rabbis decided to, 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 to uh, we're going to settle this thing about Messiah, and they used the mystical arch to ascend into heaven. 
And mm. they had to, now they had to outdo the Apostle Paul because, you know, the New Testament said he went up to the third heaven. And so they went up to the seventh heaven. Seventh heaven, yes. And, uh, and all but two of them died. The, the one that was in Akiba said he went up there and saw two identical gods, which would have validated Messiah. So they said that he went crazy in the process. And only mm-hmm. Akiba got up there and, and got the secret sauce, if you will, mm. and, then began, wow. and then began formulating what is now uh, Kabbalah or the magical working that, that permeates so much of Judaism. Uh, but he's also the one that uh, Chris and Simon Bar Kochba, as the Messiah that created the third Jewish revolution that resulted in the absolute destruction of Jerusalem. Yes, and yes so, absolutely. So his, this, this guy his was connection busy. Is, was a big thing. Go ahead. No, I, I mean, this guy was busy. <laughs> he was. He was a, uh, a very key figure, you know, in this, what I really call kind of a recreation of Judaism, um, you know, because it really, the old Judaism was based on temple worship. The new Judaism would be based upon wisdom, upon the Mishnah and the Talmud, and as you point out, the Kabbalah. And uh, and so you really see the, the, the divergency then, the distance between Christianity and Judaism at this point. Now, a lot of people could say, okay, Woodward, well, not only are you, a ba- are you bashing the King James Version, you're also anti-Semitic. No, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. I, I am criticizing, in effect, the Pharisees, like Jesus did, <laughs> and like Peter and Paul did, uh, for what they did to the Scripture. So I, I don't take kindly to the fact that they changed the Scripture. We won't talk about what they did in the first century to the Messiah, but you know, I'll point out the fact that they changed their own Scripture, and they did that to give themselves an author- to get themselves authority, and they they brought in the oral law, and there some of the things that they, they the respect the disrespect that they had even for Moses. Um, there's some quotes that I got from the Talmud that I I, I include in the book, which was that uh, Moses was unhappy that there was so much um, love and appreciation for Akiba, um, and God told him that he just had to be quiet and sit on the eighth row back behind the other rabbis because they knew uh, that Akiba had the real truth. And uh, and so Moses was uh, literally sent into the peanut gallery because uh, he didn't understand the oral law, even though contradictorily it is taught that Moses was given the oral law at the same time, he was given the written law, and he passed it to Joshua, and Joshua passed it to the other elders, and that eventually it was passed down and became, in effect, the gnosis of the Hebrews, and it became, uh, you know, filtered into what was the the oral law, and so, you know, so that's where we we wind up with a real divergency between the, the Old Testament Judaism and. The, the Judaism that uh, that we've seen really in the last, well, almost 2,000 years. And uh, the Judaism today, with a very, very few exceptions, the Kar- Kararites, is that how you pronounce it, uh, yeah, Dr. Lake? Kararites? Kararites? Um, they, are, they don't subscribe to the oral law. They believe the written law is, uh, is God's law. But other, other than that, the rabbis do, of course, follow the Talmud and the Mishnah, and, uh, and then uh, Maimonides, the Mishnah Torah, his Mishnah Torah. And so that's really the heritage of the new Judaism, which is the Judaism of today. Yeah, and you, you have a blending of Kabbalah, and even the uh, Encyclopedia Judaica says that, uh, that it's also a blending of Hindu philosophy. Yeah, that it, it, it makes perfect sense because of the the nature of what we see with Kabbalah and the the roots of Kabbalah in the in so much New Age, even Nazism surprisingly um, is has a Kabbalah base as well. So it's uh, it's pretty bizarre. So uh, so anyway, but uh, maybe getting back, I was going to cite a couple of uh, verses here uh, to talk about some of the distinctions. Um, I have about you know, to over two dozen I list in the book. There's more that I discover all the time, and as I say. I'll probably spend, as I spend the rest of my life, I'll probably discover more and more important differences um, that uh, that exist between the Septuagint and the and the Masoretic. But um, let me share a couple of verses. Uh, Romans fifteen twelve quotes Isaiah eleven ten, and this is a pattern you see in several passages. So I'll read Mos- I'll read Romans fifteen twelve first. And again, Isaiah says, "The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope." And then Isaiah eleven ten. 
and this is from the Septuagint. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust, and his rest shall be glorious. Now, what does the King James Version, based upon the Masoretic text, say? It says this, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, okay, so far so good, but here's the difference, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. All right, so what they're saying in this change is they're diminishing the fact that the that the Gentiles will be ruled over and the Gentiles will trust in the Messiah. Instead, they want to just say, well, the Gentiles will look for the flag, the ensign, and the Gentiles will seek the flag. <laughs> It's, no, it's more than that, guys. It's more than that. And you see that in several other passages. Um, then you you see passages that really deal, uh, as you said, uh, Dr. Lake, with uh, verses, one of the best ones, one of the most, um, uh, this is in Hebrews. This verse is uh, pretty powerful. Hebrews 10.5, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, have you taken no pleasure? Uh, the Septuagint, Psalms 46, 40 verse 6, which is what Hebrews 10, 5 was quoting, says, Sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sin thou didst not require. Okay, so both of these things, you know, um, you know, the, the, the whole issue really I should focus on is is the body that thou hast prepared for me, which, of course, the, the traditional Jewish view is that God could never incarnate because God is wholly other. He is transcendent, and he could never take on flesh. So, the King James Version, quoting the Masoretic, says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. And so what you have by saying mine ears have opened versus having a body is they're saying, well, I'm listening and I'm hearing the law. And you see this in a number of verses where the, 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 the essence of salvation is the law. And uh, as you get into you begin to group all these verses together, you begin to see this pattern and you go, whoa, it's not a matter of translation. These guys were changing the text. Um, in Luke 4.18 talking about the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me when Jesus got up and read from the scroll. Um, Luke cites that he says, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Well, that's exactly what the Septuagint says in Isaiah 61.1. But that phrase, recovery of sight to the blind, which makes us think of John chapter 9, the man born blind, which was such an enormous miracle that it really got the attention of the Pharisees. Well, that is completely omitted in the King James Version. Isaiah 61.1 does not have the phrase recovery of sight to the blind. So, and I could go on. So, uh, uh, that those are just a, kind of a sampling that this is that this really is the phenomenon that occurred. And uh, let me pause and let you comment. Then I'll quote a couple of verses or some citations from uh, Augustine and Justin Martyr, which I think are pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, I I was I don't want to take us off track because I want you to follow your line of thinking, Doug. Oh, but, go ahead. Go ahead. But, well, well. One of the things that uh, that you that you argue in the book, and and I think very persuasively, is that uh, the rabbis uh, successfully in altering the text changed the chronology, and they did it mm -hmm. to a to a large degree. Uh, yes. and I'm thinking along 1,500 years mm -hmm. difference. Yep. Yep, yeah. 1612, according to my calculations, okay. uh, yeah. which the church fathers, many of the church fathers, uh, both before and then at least a dozen or more uh, Christian scholars, even after the Reformation, after the Reformation based their work on the Masoretic text, uh, even a dozen scholars afterwards said that the Septuagint's chronology is the more accurate chronology. Uh, and we, we know that because it's the chronology that Josephus used. It's the chronology that is picked up in the Samaritan Pentateuch. It's picked up in a book known as the, uh, the Book of Biblical Antiquities, a Latin book. 
Uh, and all these books had, they published, in effect, the chronology of the Septuagint uh, before Jesus was born. So, you know, these, these go back or, or early in, uh, well, I should say in the first century, con- contemporary with Jesus, either both before or contemporary. So, yeah, so you have, in effect, a major change. And, of course, the second half of the book really is dealing with the issue of chronology. Because once, once you understand that the, that the Bible was changed, then I can take you through the all of the changes uh, that were made in the chronologies, and essentially they dropped a hundred years from six or more of the of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah, and over six patriarchs from Shem to Abraham. And when so when you add all these up, you get about thirteen hundred and eighty six years. And then the other place where there's a big gap is in the the Persian kings from um, which Daniel, you know, of course, references in the in the seventy weeks, but it's the Persian kings um, that uh, that that were in effect responsible after uh, Cyprus, uh, or Cy- yeah, Cyrus came in and and conquered and the Bonadis and uh, Belshazzar and so forth. Um, so they uh, there were uh, actually thirteen kings. But only, I think it's uh, five or six of them are recognized in the Cedar Olan Rabbah that was uh, composed, the Jewish calendar, by uh, yeah, Yosef ben Halafta, who was a student of uh, Akiba. And uh, so he left out uh, a, goodness, a good number of years. And that is why the Jewish calendar is, in fact, 5779 right now. Um, rather than closer to the year 6,000. But then if you add in the other chrono- chronology changes, Genesis 5 and 11, the, the actual Jewish date right now should be about, I calculated, 7635. <laughs> so it's pretty remarkable. If it was, wow. just me, if it was just me saying that, it wouldn't be that important. But, but you, again, you've got you have Augustine and Justin Martyr. You have uh, Ephraim. Uh, the Syrian, you have a bunch, Hypolatus, I think it was. So you've got all these church fathers, and you've got a dozen after the Reformation that are saying the same things. So you've got a lot of substantiation that that this chronology was changed. Of course, it makes a big difference if you're a young Earth creationist, and uh, and I argue that you know you'd be better off as a young Earth creationist adding these years in because once you do, guess what happens? All of a sudden, then you can align. The uh, archaeology, you can align e- Egyptology and archaeology in Mesopotamia with the Bible. All of a sudden, it fits. The flood of Noah is a thousand years earlier. The Tower of Babel is uh, almost a thousand years earlier. And so, uh, all of a sudden, we have a much stronger witness uh, in terms of the Bible uh, as, its, as its testimony against, uh, we'll say, secular humanism and science and so forth. Well, Doug, if if the early church, I mean, you just named a bunch of them. If the early church fathers knew what the rabbis had done, why aren't we taught that today? Uh, It's remarkable. I think it's because we're so dominated by the Reformation. As Mm -hmm. Protestants, uh, you know, we look back to the Reformation. We assume that Martin Luther and John Calvin and so forth, that uh, Zwingli and those guys, that they made all the right decisions for us. You know, they, they likely chose the Hebrew Bible because... They saw the Vulgate, the Catholic Bible, as an enemy. They saw the the Septuagint, the Bible of the Orthodox, uh, as as an enemy. And so they said, well, if we're going to base our authority on the Bible, certainly we should go back to the Hebrew. And so they went back to the Hebrew, to the Masoretic text, and uh, and they based that, they used that as the basis of the uh, the Protestant Reformation. And so, frankly, all of these other things were overlooked. I'm sure language had a big part to play. Um, you know, I don't know how much Greek John Calvin knew, but Calvin and Luther were both Lutheran. I mean, excuse me, they were both um, Catholics, and so they knew Latin. And uh, and so they were using the Vulgate. Well, the Vulgate was based, for the most part, on the Hebrew Masoretic text as well. There's a few places, and this is the telltale sign, a few places where Jerome did not have, for instance, the last page or so of Revelation. And instead of the tree of life in Revelation 22, he uses the term book of life, which is what um, 
was in the in in the Hebrew, I believe it was, uh, or I may be getting confused with the Receptus uh, Texas Receptus. But anyway, there there was a major difference there, and so um, <laughs> so you have some some remarkable uh, things that went on there. And so yeah, we we are focused on the Hebrew as the Protestants, and then you get into the whole New Testament story, Texas Receptus, the majority text, the Westcott and Hort thing, all of this stuff that comes. Uh, comes rushing to the surface when you're dealing with the King James only, only folks. So yeah, so we we weren't taught these things. We didn't know about the Septuagint. We knew well. We knew it existed. We knew that there were some differences, uh, but we didn't realize that the differences. Just as Doctor Lake, just as you said, it it wasn't just about translation. There were actual intentional changes made. And uh, I've got a quote here from Augustine, which I think is pretty pretty cool. Let me see if I can find that quote. Um, Let's see here. Is this the Augustine quote? Let's see. The church fathers. Uh, yeah, here's what Augustine said. Um, he says, numerous church fathers testify to the lengths to which Orthodox Judaism went to discredit Jesus's messianic office, a phenomenon also recorded throughout the book of Acts. Justin Martyr says that the rabbis deliberately expunged or altered messianic verses from their scriptures in their project of discrediting Lord Jesus as Messiah. All right. According to Justin, the second century Jews were still promulgating the lie that the disciples had stolen Christ's body from the tomb. Augustine writes that, the, quote, the Jews, every um, envying us for our translation to, oh, excuse me, I was quoting Sexton and Smith. This last part now is, uh, is the Augustine quote. The Jews, envying us for our translation of their law and prophets, have made alterations in their text to undermine the authority of ours. That's from, uh, uh, I guess, I'm not sure it's Civ, it's abbreviated, uh, not being an Augustine expert, 1511. So, uh, so th- that is what Augustine uh, indicates. So, uh, and then I quote, I do a whole thing on Justin Martyr and the Dialogue of Trifo in the book as well. So, yeah, so the church fathers uh, talk about this. Many of the church fathers, the chronology they build, they build it out to where instead of 4,004 years before Christ, there was between 5,400 and 5,600 years before Christ, which really uh, corresponds then with the Septuagint. Man, you know, I I think... All this is one of the things in my own research, uh, especially when you're looking at the, uh, you know, Watchers Genesis 6 and a lot of the stuff that I and Tom Horn and many others do. We mm-hmm. all find ourselves going back to the Septuagint because the Septuagint includes statements that aren't quite as clear in, in the King James Version because it's using the Masoretic text. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I thank God is this, for various reasons, God has a lot of us going back over and over again to the, to the Septuagint. Uh, to begin doing our research, and, and I think it's going to become a valuable tool in the last days. Uh, one of the questions I do have mm-hmm. is, you know, when we have the Dead Sea Scrolls come out, uh, is there anything validating the accuracy of the Teptuagent over the Mesoretic text that's been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Um, yes. Uh, first off, there, there's you know more Hebrew text in the Dead Sea in the Kumaram caves than there is Septuagint. But the Septuagint accounts for I think I think over 10 percent of the manuscripts found. Um, and what we see we see the Jewish scholars that like Emmanuel Tov T O V is uh, is one of the leading authorities on the Septuagint. And um, and he and then the authors of uh, that that put together the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, uh, they they all are saying that if you go to the passages uh, in the Septuagint, what you find is a more authentic reading of the ancient Hebrew than the Hebrew that is in the uh, in the caves itself. And so they're basically saying we have now an opportunity with the Dead Sea Scrolls to begin to work back to the uh, the very earliest form of the Septuagint, and uh, that combined with the codices that we have and so forth, Sinaiticus and Alexandri- Alexandrianus, uh, Alexandrianus, I think it is, um, and, uh, and, so, and Vaticanus, we have codices, all these things give us an opportunity to 
to see that the Septuagint is the more accurate version of the original Hebrew. Yes, there are translation problems, and no, the, the translators didn't translate the, the Hebrew idioms perfectly in all cases, but when it comes to the material things, the doctrines, uh, you're going to find the Septuagint right on point, and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls help to confirm that. The, the, as I was starting to say, the Jewish scholars, and these are the Jewish scholars, they are, uh, they are sensing the same things. Uh, I got this one quote I got to share with you, though. This is great. This had to do with, um, um, if we got time, I'm going to do this. How are we on time, by the way? We, we don't have a time limit, so we're great. Oh, we're great. Okay. So uh, J.R. Church um, did a, a really masterful job in one of his books, Daniel Reveals the Bloodline of Christ, tracing the the Persian kings, and he lists the, you know, the various Dariuses and Xerxes and Artaxerxes and all that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to see why it's confusing. But, um, you know, what he points out is that there was an exclusion of about 164 to 165 years out of the 207 years that the Persian kings ruled. And he quotes Rabbi Simon Schwab, who agreed that there is a blatant omission. And in his book, Comparative Jewish, Jewish Chronology, Rabbi Schwab states the following. This is, this is great. <laughs> it say, he says, it should have been possible that our sages, which is another word for rabbis, uh, for some unknown reason, had covered up a certain historic period and purposefully eliminated and suppressed all records and other material pertaining thereto. We know, and this is what the scholars say, that when that the that the rabbis destroyed the text, but they didn't count on the fact that the Essenes had hidden text in the caves. All right. So anyway, going back to Rabbi Schwab. If so, what might have been their compelling reason for so unusual a procedure, uh, i.e. to destroy the text? Well, nothing short of a divine command could have prompted these, those saintly men of truth to leave out completely from our annals a period of 165 years and to correct all data in historic tables in such a fashion that the subsequent chronological gap could escape being noticed by countless generations, known to a few initiates only who were duty bound to keep the secret to themselves. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> so, pretty, pretty powerful. Well, these guys were so holy, God told them that they needed to hide those 165 years. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, so if you add those 165 to the 1386 and the chronologies, you come up with this 1612, I think, which is that, that plus there's a few other things that you have to look at in terms of the period of the judges and the timing of the, the kings when the actual division occurs in the kingdom between uh, Judah and Israel, the northern kingdom. And, and I work through all of that in the, uh, in the book, as well as do a comparison with Egyptian chronology, which is important as well if you're trying to, to really get back to when did the Tower of Babel occur, you know, when might the pyramids have been built. When did the flood occur, and so forth? So, so I get into all those things in the second part of the book. So here's here's the question, Doug. Uh, I am okay. confident that many of our listeners are wondering this very thing: How do we reconcile the idea that if the the Masoretic texts were corrupted, mm -hmm. how and what bearing does that have on the doctrine of inerrancy? How do we reconcile that? Right. Well, it gets, it, you know, it gets back to we as Protestants, there's two things. One is that we believe that the original autographs, the original autographs that, you know, the, the original writings of the prophets mm -hmm. and the apostles, that they were free from taint. They were free from error. But over time, uh, there were scribal additions and so forth into the text. But we believe that God preserves the text and what we find, and this is a, there's F.F. F. Bruce and another of other scholars, they make the point, there's, there's one that talks about the tenacity of the text. And what, what that means is that the original text, with very, very, very few uh, uh, exceptions to this rule, the original text is in the Bible. It's, there have been additions made, but there have been almost no subtractions made. And so then by doing the, the sort of the investigative work of textual criticism, we get back to 99.99% of what was originally written. Now, the King James only 
uh, crew, that crowd, they reject that. They say, well, we don't have the original autograph, so that's meaningless. You know, because we don't have it, that's meaningless. And they will not accept the concept that that what many, uh, you know, virtually all evangelical scholars say is that although there are hundreds, if not several thousand, changes, those changes have to do with spellings, they have to do with, um, I would say, you know, grammatical changes through the ages, uh, they have to do primarily with additions, uh, where a scribe added a word or added a phrase to clarify. In some cases, they added things that um, were not really in the original, thinking that that followed more with the doctrine of that day. And so we have a few of those additions, one a fairly major one in First John. Um, and uh, I, won't attempt to, I won't attempt to quote it at this point, though, but it has to do with the water and the blood. These three testify, so forth. Dr. Lake, you may remember what that's called. But, but anyway, that, that was added in, clearly in addition, not in the original. And, um, and so you have all that. So Protestants believe in this principle called Scripture interprets Scripture. And so if we have a problem or a concern about a scripture, you know, do we have the, the right scripture and so forth? And does it, you know, it, that it, and it may influence our thinking about the doctrine. Well, what the Protestant view is, is that we look at other scriptures and we look at other scriptures to help us understand what this scripture may be saying or that this scripture may have been an addition. It may have been added in. It may be an error. And so scripture interpreting scripture plus just the science of textual criticism. And you got, you know, an, um, you have so many amazing, you have, Dr. Like you could confirm this, but we, we got at least hundreds and hundreds of scholars that devote their lives just to this kind of research to take us back to to what is, in effect, the original uh, original work, the original uh, autographs of the of both the New Testament and the Old Testament. I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing uh, some of the newer translations that are that are very diligent in being interpretations rather than paraphrase that they still vary because they're bringing in such a uh, a wealth of information uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls and looking back at the Septuagint uh, hmm. that uh, we're actually getting a more accurate uh, translation. And, yes, and I that, believe that's true. For me, the ESV, the English Standard Version, is doing that. Um, it is both uh, referencing material that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well as variances with the Septuagint. And so the ESV does a particularly nice job of that. There's a lot of here for us to think about. Uh, now, this, this, basically what you're doing with this book is you're laying out the basics, but there's more coming in the second volume, isn't there? Well, there is. Uh, the second half of the book, as I said, uh, I really deal with a chronology. And to deal with a chronology, you really have to dig into the whole issue of the Exodus. When did the Exodus occur? You know, and if, if we're going to get that right, we have to understand the period of the Judges, which is probably the most difficult period. And yet the Bible does provide the information, but you have to do a lot of hunting and searching to find it. Uh, and it provides enough information that we can be pretty clear on it. Um, and uh, And so... Uh, I get into some maybe a surprise or two uh, in terms of of I identify the uh, the Exodus as occurring almost 200 years earlier than even the conservative view. The liberal view is that if the Exodus occurred at all, it occurred in 1250 BC. The conservative view is it occurred roughly 1450 BC. Um, I I have worked out, and I believe, based upon the scholars I've looked at, that it actually occurred in 1628 BC, the same time as the the great um, volcano Santorini or Thera blew up on the island of Santorini in Greece. And then I have my reasons, which I go into the book to talk about. But what happens is once you know when the Exodus occurs, then you can move back and find out when Isaac was born, when Abraham was born. And once you are at Abraham, if you believe that I, and I do, that Genesis 5 and 11, which I believe were written by Moses, if you believe that those chronologies are, those genealogies are in fact chronologies, you can work all the way back you know, and be, I think, within one year of when Adam was, uh, Adam and Eve were created specially by God. Does it mean I'm, I'm a young earther? Because I still think that there's a chance that, you know, that, that something else happened before 
God created Adam and Eve. But um, and, but I think that that's really the the message of the book. And so uh, so I get into really exploring all these things. Uh, when the kingdom divided, where the evangelical scholars went wrong, uh, following um, both uh, Henry William Green's essay in 1890 um, regarding the nature of uh, biblical genealogies and chronologies, and then another major error with a scholar in the 1950s named uh, Thiel, uh, T-H-I-E-L-E, I believe it is, and uh, his discussion upon when the uh, when the kingdom split, which he dates – too late by about 40 some years and so you add all these things together and you can work back to where your chronology is uh, i believe very very accurate um and again you have all the confirmation from the church fathers uh, and from scholars after the reformation confirming these things so usher the 4004 bc thing is not the final truth it in fact did not that idea didn't even exist really until the rabbis changed the chronologies in the uh, the first century AD, <laughs> folks, you've got to get the book, rebooting <laughs> the Bible. I mean, there's Doug. There's so much more that we could we could dig into. That uh, Mike, you probably would agree with this. We could talk for three hours and and really not cover uh, everything in this book. I, I'm holding it in my hand right now. It's it's three hundred and and uh, eighty six. Well, pages yeah before you get to the appendices and the glo and the indices and <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> bibliography yes, and yes. all that hey yeah, and I listen just, yeah. listen folks doug even gives us a he gives us a little taste a draft outline of part two what's coming in Re yeah. rebooting the bible uh, volume yeah. two uh get the book rebooting the bible the astonishing story of a 1900 year old rabbinical conspiracy to corrupt the bible's ancient history and thwart beliefs in jesus as messiah that's the whole point in writing it mm, that's right indeed yeah and it, i think it needs to be part of everybody's library as well as many of doug's other books i mean he has a done does a fantastic job on just about everything he writes uh, no, thank you I, I'm, I'm building a yeah. good library of of doug woodward and <laughs> and uh well well, Mike, you mentioned uh, as when we started our conversation, you mentioned, you mentioned PowerQuest, uh, the two volumes. It just so happens that I'm reading through book one right now. So mm. I'm, I'm, I'm about halfway through book one. I've had them on my shelf for quite some time. And I thought, okay, it's time for me to pull that down and read it. So uh, you're absolutely right, Doug. I appreciate uh, your your heart and your passion for the Lord, your your capabilities and uh, you. and and your your uh, your research is is fantastic, spot on. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, and and I'm I'm just hopeful that I can convince some of those people out on Facebook that I really am not possessed by a demon. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I actually am indwelt by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, just because I don't follow Peter Ruckman doesn't mean that I'm I'm not born again. So, yeah. <laughs> and I, I hope God uses this work to begin leading a lot more of the Jewish community to Messiah. Yes. Yeah. No. I, I actually uh, there's a there's a, a Jew that is uh, translates Russian. He lives in Jerusalem. He's actually campaigning. I'll, I should send you guys this article. It's really fabulous because it confirms almost everything. Well, not almost everything. Confirms many of the major points that I'm saying. But he's he's arguing that what needs to happen next is that the Septuagint needs to be translated back into Hebrew, so that the Jews mm. can see what their original scripture actually said. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I'll send you this article. Well, it's just, it's, it, yes, uh, I'd say, Mike, Mike Spalding, I'd tell you that it would catch your hair on fire, but that, you know, there's not a lot up there to burn. There's not, so. yeah, I was going to say, that's a long past time for that to happen. <laughs> so, well, very guys, very we, good. We encourage you to go to uh, Doug's website, faith-happens.com. Uh, you can check out his book as well as many others. Plus, they're all available on on Amazon, like all of us. That uh, that's usually where I go, unless the author has mm. uh, some other stuff that maybe Amazon doesn't carry. Uh, mm. But guys, right. this this is a good book. It needs to be in your library. I think it'll, it will uh, answer some questions and give you a thousand other questions. But that's all a part of research, isn't it, guys? Amen. Yeah. That's Amen. right. Yeah. Amen. Well, Thank that, you, gentlemen, for the opportunity. I enjoy spending time with you, as always. Thank you, Doug. Wonderful having you on today. Thank you. Oh,